Excellent! Team Group's Dark Z series of DDR4 gaming memory features an aggressive yet stylish armored design with high performance aluminum alloy heat sinks to keep thermals in check. The Dark Z series uses specially selected high quality modules to achieve DDR4 speeds up to 3600 with XMP 2.0 support for easy setup, and kits are available in capacities of up to 32GB per DIMM, perfect for a gaming PC or a high end workstation. Click the sponsor link in the description for more, and if you're in the US, you can also check out their ongoing July giveaway, which you can still enter this week. Hello everyone and welcome back to Paul's Hardware. This is Probing Paul, my monthly Q&A series, and a few special things. First of all, this is episode number 50. Very, very happy and uh, proud of that. We've made it through 50 episodes of Probing Paul, and it still feels like the first time. Also, this is technically my second episode for the month. I already did one at the beginning of July, but uh, these have been getting fairly popular recently, so much appreciation to all you guys who have been watching them, and hopefully they're a little bit more accessible for you now that we've been doing, doing the timestamps down at the bottom, so you can jump to whatever question you m would most like to see. That said, uh, we must always begin Probing Paul by looking down the Probing Pauls of the past. There they all are. Feel free to check out my playlist if you want to dive back into some of the older episodes. I usually answer about seven to ten questions per episode. So that said, let's dive in with the first question. This one is from Fliss Floss Gaming. He says, hey Paul, love the videos, thank you very much. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that uh, you'll answer this. I built my PC about a month ago, I've gotten into more video editing, I'm considering upgrading my RAM. I have dual channel, four DIMMs, I think he means four DIMM slots. And he has two eight gig sticks currently installed for a 16 gig setup, which is pretty standard for a uh, starter build these days. If I were to buy another two sticks, but 16 gigs, does it matter if I install bigger sticks or higher capacity in the current empty slots versus the ones occupied by the eight gig sticks? So I like this question because it actually seems fairly simple and straightforward. And it's one of those things where when you're talking about building a PC, you often gloss over. I very often recommend a, getting a motherboard that has four memory slots. Some of the really inexpensive ones will have just two. That allows you the upgrade path to add more in the future. But I rarely talk about how you're actually going to do that upgrade and what you might want to take into consideration. With memory, other than the standard, which is DDR4 pretty much across the board right now, there's three things you need to consider. One is going to be the capacity, of course. How many gigs per stick are you working with? and we're talking about eight gigs per stick right now for 16 gigs total on two sticks. But we now have 16 gig DIMMs. So you can have 16 gigs in a single memory uh, module and two of those would make 32. Beyond capacity though, there's also memory speed and uh, it's usually represented by a number like 3200, 3400, 2666. That's actually the mega transfers per second speed. And if you look at your actual operating system or you look at some reporting software, it will list the frequency it runs at. So 3200 speed memory actually runs at 1600 megahertz, but it's double data rate, DDR, which gives you 3200 mega transfers per second, even though the frequency stays the same. DDR memory transfers data on both the rising and falling edges of the clock, and that's how it doubles the data rate. And then there are timings, usually referred to as cast latency, but these are referring to specific things that the memory does and how often it actually does it. This is why lower timings are usually better if a memory is going to perform a task like column address strobe or row address strobe, and it does it in 14 cycles rather than 16, that's going to be a little bit faster. All that is to say, if you're going to take your 16 gig kit and you're going to add another 32 gigs in the other two open slots, yes, you can totally do that and it will totally work as long as you still use DDR4 memory, of course. Will it then also run at its rated speed? Typically, if you're trying to just go in and pl plug in XMP settings, it's only going to read those off of one of your DIMMs. And if you try to plug in XMP settings for one kit and you have a different kit in there, it may or may not work. And that has to do with the memory mod modules in the memory itself. And memory manufacturers like G-Skill will take all the memory modules they produce, they will test them to see what uh, speed they're able to achieve on a consistent basis, and then they'll drop those into memory kits rated for that speed or lower. So the solution that's most often recommended for people who are upgrading from two DIMMs to four is to buy the exact same kit if you can. Same capacity, same timings, that way you can plug in the XMP values for one kit, it will apply across all of them, and you'll make sure you have modules inside that can run at the speed that you're trying to tell it to run at. Of course, if you want to buy a higher capacity kit, then you may or may not be able to find a higher capacity with the same speed and the same timings as the kit you already have. In that case, you could plug them both in and try XMP values and it may or may not work. You could then go back into your UEFI BIOS and manually control the timings and you could probably find something that's sort of a lowest common denominator between the two kits to get it up and running. But not everyone likes to go in and play with memory timings. That can be a little bit more of a daunting task than just going in and say enabling XMP. But then there's one last thing to take into consideration and I think this is one of those things that's less commonly known in the PC building world. If you buy 
a two dim kit with XMP values, it's gonna have XMP values for two dims. If you buy a four stick kit all together as one kit, it's gonna have different XMP values. It will have different settings for four dims that might be tuned better to work across four dims than perhaps the more aggressive timings that you might get in your single two dim kit. And that can be the difference between the same memory kit being installed in the same system with the same memory kit next to it and it actually not working rather than working. But if I can try to sum up all of this, the upshot would be if your goal is more capacity, then get those two more 16 gig sticks and just try to find speeds and timings that are as close to the current kit that you already have as possible. Bearing in mind though that after you install them, you might need to go into your UEFI and tweak some things in order to get everything running at the right speed. Alternatively, you could just try to find that same exact 16 gig kit that you already have and add it in and then you'd have 32 gigs total but probably a little bit more likelihood of running at the speed that you want to run at. I think the best solution for you though, although it would cost a little bit more, would be to try to find a brand new 64 gig kit. That would give you the most memory overall. That would give you a kit that you could plug in the XMP values and be fairly confident that it would work no matter what. And you would avoid that entire hassle of having to go in possibly to your UEFI to tweak speeds and timings in order to get everything running properly. So hopefully you guys know a little bit more about memory configurations now. Again, just one of those things that uh, seems simple on the face of it, but there's there's always a little bit more depth if you can go into it a bit more. Next question though is from Steven Mason. Thank you very much, Steven. Do you need to reinstall graphics drivers on a new system for a GPU you've taken from a previous build? There's a couple ways to read this question. If you're taking a GPU from a different build, it will not bring the drivers with it, no. So yes, you do need to install graphics drivers from that GPU. Speaking more generally, if you're simply upgrading a graphics card in an existing system, you may or may not need to update the graphics drivers. If you're using NVIDIA, for example, they have a driver package that they distribute that's compatible with a wide array of their various graphics cards. So if you're upgrading from like an RTX 2060 to an RTX 2080, chances are you can just shut down your system, remove the existing card, install the new one, the drivers that are already installed to recognize the new hardware and update themselves to the proper settings and you'll be good to go. However, much like with installing Windows and people asking me questions like, I upgraded hardware, can I use my existing Windows installation? The answer becomes, yes, you can, and there's a decent chance it will work, but what if it doesn't? So my answer is always gonna hopefully include, uh, if it doesn't work, if you need to start from scratch, if you need to just wipe the slate and start fresh, how would you go about doing that? So let me walk you through that really quickly. The first thing you're gonna want to do is go ahead and download DDU or Display Driver Uninstaller, which is available over at guru3d.com. Here's a quick look at the interface, although I do believe it might be a little updated from here, but you can choose whether you have an NVIDIA or an AMD graphics card installed, and then you can clean and restart. And this will wipe the drivers and settings and everything and basically give you a clean start so you can install the driver fresh. You will need to boot into safe mode though, ideally, in order to run DDU. So after you have downloaded and installed it, uh, you can check out this video from 2018, but still very valid today about some shortcuts uh, to accessing your UEFI. So if you hold down the shift button while you go to restart Windows 10, it will take you into this menu right here. This gives you some advanced options such as uh, going to a command prompt or start or prepare, or you can use this to directly access your UEFI, which is really convenient. Now I've seen this menu change from time to time with different Windows updates, but if you click on the see more recovery options, you should be able to access advanced startup settings. Then when it restarts, it will show you this menu. Then you can hit four to launch into safe mode. And from there you can go in and run DDU and clean your drivers and then restart from there back into normal Windows mode. After that, I would just download the latest drivers either directly from Nvidia or directly from AMD, depending on what type of graphics card you have, uh, reinstall them and you're off to the races. I hope that helps you out, Steven. Next question here is from Pacal, P Hey, Cal, uh, just changed my dynamic range to full in NVIDIA control panel color settings, as I've been told it's a better option than the default one. After changing it, the color seems odd to me in games. Don't know if it's just because I use a default one or full dynamic range, or if things look worse, please share your knowledge. And he is using a, a monitor here, 34, actually an, an ultra wide Alienware IPS panel with display port. So he's not connecting to a TV. So if you open up your NVIDIA control panel uh, and you go down to change resolution, you have the resolution you're connected to and it should show your monitors there and everything. Everything. And then you can do different settings. There's a default and there's NVIDIA color settings. And in the past, this did use to default, or from what I'm reading, this did use to default the output dynamic range to limited 
rather than full. And this is talking about when you're using RGB color, uh, there's values between zero and 255, and it limits those values specifically for working properly with televisions that can't actually display the entire range. So if you were on limited and you switch to full and then suddenly things look weird, my assumption would be that you're connected to a TV that doesn't have that full color range. That said, you are not connected to a TV, you are connected to what seems to be a fairly decent IPS monitor. So this might be a question of matching the settings uh, from your output from your graphics card with the settings on your monitor. I would dive into your monitor's menu settings and see if you can change the color range there. Make sure that the color range settings match what's on your PC. Pretty much everyone should be on 32-bit for the color depth, but then there's the output color depth, and this is gonna do tone mapping uh, to match the colors that are capable of being displayed on your panel. So here again, you can also change between eight and 10-bit. If you have a 10-bit panel, you should go with 10-bit. And then the color format, again, is mostly gonna be RGB, but if you do have a fancier display that can do uh, one of these other modes, these have 422 or 444 chroma subsampling, and I'm not gonna dive into chroma subsampling right now, but let's just say the short story here is that 444 is gonna give you the maximum amount of color depth, so you can go with that if it's an option, but again, your display is going to need to be capable of this, and most of them are just gonna use RGB. You also might wanna double check the NVIDIA global settings uh, in the drivers versus if there are specific settings for a game that you might be playing that might not have been updated, so that might help you out as well. But just so you don't feel bad when it comes to uh, color depth, output modes, uh, going from 8-bit to 10-bit to 12-bit, there's a ton of detail there, a ton of nuance, and it's stuff that I'm, I'm still trying to learn and grasp and, and get wedged into my head as well. So, so don't feel bad, and if you wanna read a little bit more, this, is, this article's a little bit dated, but uh, it's got a little bit of info on NVIDIA cards not displaying full RGB via, via HDMI. Again, this is something that I do believe has been updated uh, with, the, with more recent driver updates. Limited RGB is 16 to 235 levels of differentiation per color uh, versus full RGB, which is zero to 255. But this also has a link to this image, and you can really quickly just pull this image up and look and you should be able to see white and then a uh, sort of a gray, and you should be able to see black and then sort of a darker gray here, and that will tell you. If you just see a white on the left and black on the right, that means you're in limited mode and you should go and try to fix it. Next question here from Alpha Zwack. Uh, hey Paul, awesome content. Thank you very much, Alpha. Really enjoy watching your videos. Just want to ask uh, for 2D and 3D modeling and rendering PCs. Do they have the same demands as video editing and rendering PCs? So this is kind of a follow-up to the question I answered uh, in the first Probing Paul earlier in July. If so, does that mean every workstation will have the same build path? The true answer to your question here is that it's going to vary based on the software. Uh, different software is designed different ways. Some software is going to benefit more from low latency on a system. Some software is going to benefit from having having a massive amount of memory to work with. Some software is gonna benefit from that memory being very fast memory, and some software just wants there to be a lot of it. So if you're choosing parts for your system and your plan is to overbuild it so it's capable of doing the stuff not just that you wanna do with it right now, but handling stuff you might wanna do with it in the future, uh, yes, there's, there's a lot of crossover there. And a lot of times you'll find the same requirements or the same recommendations uh, for your PC hardware with this piece of CAD software and this piece of software from you know, like Adobe Premiere something like that. So the generic advice would be to focus on the parts for your computer that have the greatest impact on performance, uh, which would be your CPU and how many cores and threads it has, as well as the frequency it runs at, your memory, how much capacity it has, how uh, the speed it runs at, then the timings, and if latency or lower latency is something that benefits the application you're working with. Storage may or may not be a factor. Often storage is just a, an issue of getting software loaded up, but if you're working with software that has to pull a huge amount of data off, to, off of your storage and something like a high-speed NVMe SSD might be something that benefits you. And then of course there's a graphics card and the graphics card might have video memory that your software may or may not take advantage of. And then your graphics card might also have something like a, like CUDA cores or a built-in uh, video encoder that might also may or may not benefit you. Again, it just depends on the software. So, so I would say hone in on the software that you're working with and then try to look for reviews that have specifically looked at that software and its performance across a range of hardware configurations. Those reviews are a little bit more niche, but uh, when when you need them, uh, they can be extremely helpful. Next question from Norman Hexima. Hey Paul, love the show, appreciate the content. Thank you very much, Norman. I'm wondering if there is a cost-effective means to have a gaming PC in my office that streams to my uh, my TV in another room. Long overdue to, to get a new PC, currently working with something in the Core 2 Duo range, but can't justify having two different PCs in different rooms. So you've probably heard the phrase, there's more than one way to skin a cat, and I've never quite understood where that derives from, but uh, the point being, there's more than one way to solve the issue that you're trying to solve here, Norman, and I, 
have solved it by just having multiple computers in different rooms. But I don't need to do that. And there are lots of ways to have one powerful computer somewhere in your home that you can also access to play games with or uh, watch other content on elsewhere in your home. Since you mentioned cost effective, the first solution I would recommend is a long HDMI cable and a wireless or wired, depending on the location of the gaming PC and where the room is that you want to send stuff to. That way you can just run, say, an HDMI or a DisplayPort cable through a wall or around a wall or something like that to your TV. And then you can maybe also have a USB receiver for a keyboard and mouse, bring that around as well. And then all you have to do is display switch between the two. You can have multiple inputs connected. So when you're in the uh, gaming room, uh, you can just watch on the TV and use a keyboard and mouse that you have there. And when you're in the computer room, you can just use the keyboard and mouse that you have set up in there, and, and that should work for you. Practically speaking, that may or may not be possible though, depending on, again, where the room is you want to stream to and where your system actually is. If you have more distance between the rooms, you might even go with something like this. It's called uh, HD Base T, which basically is a couple units, takes an HDMI input on one of them, then you run an ethernet cable from one to the other, then HDMI out of the other one, and this can let you take really long runs, I believe up to like 50 or 100 feet, and it also lets you use uh, ethernet Ethernet cable, which can be less expensive than, say, a really long HDMI cable. These range in price depending on what resolution you need and if you're going 4K or not. That said, this is probably going to add a bit of latency. So uh, if you're talking about gaming in particular, this might me not be a solution that you want to go with. The other solution would be to have like a small lightweight client PC in your gaming room uh, that accesses usually over Wi-Fi or your local network, uh, your gaming PC, and then it can stream content as well as games. If you use Steam for your PC gaming, for example, there is a built-in function there called Steam Link, where if you have Steam running on two different systems in a home and you have a game installed on one, you can play that game on the other system even though it's running on one system. All you need is a Wi-Fi connection. There are some requirements for the client PC in that scenario though, so you may or may not have a cost-effective solution for that. You could potentially take your existing Core 2 Duo system and use that as a client PC to access a newly built system across the network. There used to be something called Steam Link that sold for as little as $2.50 but this basically acts as a little client to access Steam games from elsewhere on your network. The limitation here would be that uh, you can only play Steam games. So there are other solutions. For example, uh, NVIDIA has the NVIDIA Shield. That's a little bit more capable. They have individual gaming units as well as the Shield TV, which just is just a little box that you set on there. This is useful because it can run by itself and it has compatibility with uh, more advanced functions like uh, Dolby Vision and Atmos for HDR, as well as AI upscaling going from HD to 4K. This is a standard alone unit so you can use it to, to stream Netflix and stuff like that and then you can also use it to access a gaming system that you have elsewhere on the network to stream a game across it. Again there's going to be a little bit of an issue with latency there but it's not too bad from my understanding with the more recent implementations. Even with all that said though this, this is definitely not the only solutions for the problem that you currently have so just trying to throw a few of those out there and if you guys are watching this and you're like oh I do this but use a completely different method please leave those in the comment section down below Below, as well as your questions for next time I do Probing Paul, and maybe I can come back to this with some other ideas. Moving right along, I'm gonna try to answer the rest of these a little bit more quickly, but Sadman1471 says, uh, how many friend requests do you get on Overwatch after showing gameplay? And did Joe get the monitor from the 60 hertz versus 240 hertz gaming video uh, that I just posted last week? If you guys didn't have a chance, check it out. Uh, 240 hertz gaming, very, very effective. If you're playing uh, an FPS or a shooter, uh, I recommend it, especially if you wanna be competitive. To get a higher refresh rate, 144 hertz is good. Too. To answer your question though, uh, no, Joe did not get the 240 hertz monitor. It's, it's actually right there. My wife and I have wanted to play Overwatch side by side, and now that we have two 240 hertz monitors, we can do that. But I have promised Joe that I will work towards getting him a 240 hertz monitor as quickly as possible. The other part of your question is uh, Overwatch friend requests. I kind of have a method for both Steam and uh, the Blizzard uh, Battle.net app or whatever, uh, which is that my name is very generic. So unless you have that little hashtag with the code on the end, it's hard to send me a friend request. That said, ever since I've been streaming on YouTube for many, many years now, I've shown my accounts here and there, it pops up, it's it's hard to avoid. So I get friend requests all the time. Short story is I have a long list of active friend requests and every so often I have to go in there and just clear it out because I have no idea where they're coming from. And if you add someone as a friend on one of these services, sometimes it can give them the ability to, to ping you or ask you questions or whatever. And often 
I'm going in there just to play, run some benchmarks. So I have to sort of minimize distractions like that. I do add friends from time to time, but it usually goes along with when we do our live streams. Here is a long question from BC Field Technician. And this is a question that I'm not going to answer because I do not know the answer, or at least I'd be taking shots in the dark, which I don't usually like to do. The question is about Linux and using Ryzen with Linux. And I'll leave it here if you guys want to read over it. Lots of questions, good questions. It's probably the same questions that I would have if I was diving into a Linux configuration. But just to be straight up with you guys, I appreciate Linux. I have a lot of respect for Linux. I have worked with Linux a very scattered few number of times and never enough to get to the point where I feel re really comfortable with it, especially to the point where I can provide advice to other people. So I'm going to point you towards someone else who I know is very familiar and comfortable with Linux, and that is uh, Level 1 Techs, and specifically Wendell over at Level 1 Techs. They even have a Level 1 Linux channel specifically dedicated to Linux, although I don't know how frequently they post videos over there. So check out this channel. I'll link it in the description if you want to look up some specific videos that might already answer the question that you have. You could also uh, hit up Wendell directly on Twitter if you want. He's Tech Wendell, and he's uh, really good at uh, replying to questions and stuff like that. Or you can go to level1techs.com. Uh, they have a forum and you might be able to post some questions on there and uh, some helpful folks might be able to jump in and answer your question in a much better way than I can here on the show. Level one techs, I'm happy to recommend them. And to round things out, uh, from my Q&A earlier in the month, there were several people who just seemed kind of blown away by that headphone jack thing that I mentioned. And if you didn't see that video, uh, the question was about using front panel audio on a computer. And I just pointed out front panel audio, when you run it through your case and plug it into your header on the motherboard here, this header for the mic and headphone jack on the front of the case often doesn't use the same sound device as the plugs on the back. So especially if you have nice headphones or something like that, plug them into the back and not the front. Uh, it's better in multiple ways. And uh, Relictus here uh, is just kind of blown away that he's had studio headphones for three years, but he's been plugging into the front panel jack. And he says, my ears, thank you. I hope you switched and I hope you noticed the difference. And I hope that has made your day a little bit better. Same thing for Mark Vaughn over here who actually asked the question that I answered last month. And in case any of you were wondering, he followed up, his headset has a quarter inch connector and the back panel has a 1 8 inch connector. Now Mark says it's an older headset and he ended up just upgrading it. Um, so that's already been done. But Mark, just so you know, uh, this is an eighth inch to quarter inch adapter, but they do also have the adapters that go the other way. Here is a uh, quarter inch to eighth inch adapter. So you can plug in your quarter inch headphones on that side and then plug the other end into your eighth inch uh, audio jack on the back of your computer. And this is about 20 bucks for a nice Sennheiser one. Since it is an analog connection, it actually does benefit from having uh, a nicer one that has gold contacts, for example, if you're truly interested in good audio quality and if you have a nice set of headphones. So Mark, don't chuck your old headphones because if it's a nice one, if it's studio grade, uh, those probably still work and you know maybe just replace the ear pads on it and something like that. Those those can last a really long time. But hopefully if you did upgrade to new headphones, they're treating you well. And uh, hopefully if you guys are watching this video, you have enjoyed it. Uh, that's gonna wrap it up for Probing Paul, episode 50. And again, if you guys have questions for me to answer in the next episode, leave them down in the comment section below. I'm strongly considering taking this from a monthly to a bi-monthly series. So let me know what you guys think of that idea as well. If you want me to be probed more frequently, we, we can make it happen. Uh, thanks again, guys. Hit the thumbs up button on your way out. We'll see you in the next one.